Tonight on Insight, should baby boys be circumcised? We were told we were bad parents for wanting to. What have you found is the main reason that people do it? It's part of our culture that you become a man. After the circumcision, we have this great big party. I think it looks better aesthetically. A person who's actually circumcised enjoys his sexual life more. How often do complications happen with circumcisions? Never lost a penis. No. It's good that you've never lost a penis. It is. <laughs> circumcision is like a surgical vaccine. That's bullshit. <laughs> no, no, that's no, not that's bullshit. bullshit. We have boys across the world that are being mutilated <laughs> for religious reasons. What have we done in our civilization to demean the foreskin? Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Let's start tonight with uh, talking about why people are getting male children circumcised. Sabina, you just had your new baby Jake circumcised. Yes. Why? For me, it was about keeping up with the family tradition. Um, we've had everyone circumcised uh, from generations and, and generations, and it's something that I don't even think about. It's something that had to happen, and um, it's something that we've discussed before. You know, we got married, and it's something out of respect to my family. And now, you're Jewish? Yes, I am Jewish. Yep. And so how old was Jake? When Jake you... was um, eight days old. Um, it happened on the eighth day. Now, Ben, you're not Jewish. No, that's right. How did you feel about this, about well, Jake being circumcised? I was done too, but I was done later on because I had some complications, sort of eight or nine years old, you know, got infections and things like that. So um, I probably maybe would have felt a little bit different about it if maybe I wasn't done. Herschel, you're actually the, uh, <coughs> the moil who performed Jake's bris. It's yes. called a bris. Yes. Mil right. Bris Miller, is that bris right? Bris Miller is the. Um, which is the circumcision ceremony, really, isn't it? The whole, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, a, a bris for a Jewish person is more than a, a, just a circumcision. There's a ceremony. The word bris, or brit if you're speaking in Ivrit, which is the Hebrew way, means a covenant, and it's, and it's the expression of, a, of, of the Jewish people's connection to God. So, obviously, we're talking something which is spiritual and something which is a belief system. In other cultures, it might be done later on when people come to manhood when they're 13 or 20 or something as part of an of a, of initiation or as part of, a, of, a, of their um, manhood ritual. But in, in Judaism it was always done at eight days as part of the covenant and it was specifically meant to be done as part of a covenant when, when, when a baby is not a party to it. Tell us what you actually did. How do you actually perform? The actual the, operation yeah. of the circumcision? Um, the technical side, it's, um, it's very well, it's, it's, um, the instrument I use is talked about, I think, in about the 600s already. What do you do, though? Um, well, sh should I show you the instrument? Yeah. The instrument of a circumcision is that. That's just basically a little, a little, um, basically a little thing with a line in it, and the foreskin is pulled up through the thing, I hope I'm not getting too technical. And then the bits that you don't want are on top and the bits that you want are on the bottom and it comes away. It's just a quick cut and so takes you about... So cut, you cut it away? Yeah. How long does that take? From starting to annoy the baby till you've got a bandage on would be about 15 seconds. And is that, it painful for the baby? Um, it can be done with anaesthetics. Um, so the answer is it's probably uncomfortable for the baby, but it um, doesn't have to be painful. Mm. Did, case, you yeah. did you watch yeah. this? Yeah, well, in our case, um, we had the, I took the anaesthetic option for baby Jake and everybody, all the, the men who were there as part of the, the sort of ceremony, you know, originally they were holding, going, like, sort of clenching. <laughs> Crossing their and legs. Then, <laughs> and then next thing it was over and they go, like, that was the most peaceful, like, circumcision we've ever been to because we're always waiting for the scream, but there's no scream. Terry <laughs> Russell, you're a GP and you've performed more than 35,000 circumcisions. Is this right? Yes, Jenny. Um, let's have a look at one you did this week. My name's Nanette and my baby is called Magnus. Magnus has just turned four weeks. I pretty much just applied a topical anaesthetic cream 
and wrap that in Glad Wrap. And what that does is that just numbs the area for the baby um, prior to procedure. I do the circumcision with a Plastibel device. The way it works is that that ring fits inside the foreskin and then it's clamped around the outside with string. The first step in this procedure is to put two clips on the end of the foreskin and separate off the foreskin from the head of the penis. Once we've separated that off and stretch the foreskin up a little. It's normal then to do a snip down the midline of the foreskin. <coughs> Just the foreskin gets snipped to open it up for fitting of the plastic bell. Oh, that's better. It is normal practice once the circulation's cut off to trim off most of the surplus foreskin because otherwise it's more likely to get infected. I'm glad it's over and done with. <laughs> you still get a bit, you know, nervous, of course, because it is a procedure. Terry, we uh, spared everyone the close-ups there while, while the baby was crying of what you're actually doing. But how does the Plastibel work? You've got one here. You can yes, show I us. Yes, I have, Jenny. So explain to us how it works. OK, the way it works is that that ring fits inside the foreskin and then it's clamped around the outside with string. The head of the penis sits there and the baby wheezes out through that hole. You can ignore the handle, that's simply for ease of insertion, that just crack, cracks off once it's in place. Now the Plastibel cuts off the circulation so that it can't bleed. What and, about being in the, pain though? How, how much pain would, would that he, child be in? Did he have, I would say zero Jenny because he wasn't reacting to what I was doing. How, did you know, how do you know that? If you put a clamp on and he doesn't flinch stands to reason. Hmm. Stan, you're shaking your head, not, not looking happy with these descriptions. Well, obviously that child was enjoying the procedure, wasn't he? I mean, heavens above. In all young boys born, the glands of the penis and the foreskin, the prepuce, are cemented together with adhesions. To perform a circumcision in a neonate, you've got to cut in there, break down all the adhesions and rip them apart from the glands, then you've got to start installing whatever device you're going to use to do the procedure. Why and is there's it, no cutting or tearing involved. Why is it involved? that it is the way it is? We are all born with foreskins. What have we done in our civilization to demean the foreskin that it needs attention of people who make their livelihood from removing it? I mean, there is an insensibility about the fact that people are using false science to declare that they have got something to offer the patient, the child, and there has been not one study in the world that has ever shown circumcision to have a public health benefit. Ben Fleming, you have a nine-month-old son uh, and you're still deciding whether or not yes. to circumcise him. Um, which way do you think you'll go? Still don't know. Um, yeah, it's I interesting see you're to hear watching this with keen interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what sort of things are you weighing up? Oh, look, um, there's, there's a, a family history um, of a circumcised, so that has a, a, a bit of influence on things. Um, Why does it have influence? The sameness argument, I guess you'd call of it. Of looking um, the same? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the opposite side of that is, um, and, and watching a procedure there, uh, I don't know whether that baby was in pain or not, but it, it really uh, kicks those emotions of a, a father um, trying to protect your child from any sort of pain. So mm -hmm. that argument in my mind is, well, is what I went through justification or what I'm seeing there? I'm and not how sure. does your wife feel? <laughs> exactly the same. It's, You're I mean, weighing it up as well. As, I'm trying to make weight up. As a mother, you, you, you look at that, you want to protect your child from that pain. So there's that factor, and then the other side is it's what my family's always done. So there's that part of your culture. Is it a culture? Yeah, yeah. In one era, you know, it was very fashionable to do, and, and now it's much less so. So. And is that justification for doing something that may hurt a child? So it's a, we don't, we're undecided. Mm. Uh, Nadim, yes. uh, you have an Indian Muslim background. Yes. What's the significance of circumcision in your culture? From my point of view, it's not really compulsory. It's actually highly recommended. 
Why, and why is it highly why recommended? Why? It has got scientific reasons. I know there are people in here who won't agree, but there are scientific reasons. Other reasons are also a person who's actually circumcised enjoys a sexual life more than a person who's not circumcised. Okay, does anyone time, else want to comment on that while we're on that subject? Uh, preferably men, actually. <laughs> how, yes. How can you tell the difference? Like, Would have you gone be... from one, gone to the other, and gone, you know, <laughs> compared it? Like, from what I know, it actually just actually reduces sensitivity. So if anything, that it reduces if anything, the girl's gonna like it more because you might be able to last a bit longer. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, it's cool. Um, I wanted to talk to you because your son Veli was circumcised when he was four years old. Why? Um, the word medical reasons. He he had infection in his around the penis. Now you have a Turkish background. I have a background. Turkish background, and now it's in our culture as well. Like um, many of the Middle Eastern, it, it is in our culture and. We've actually spoken with our son and we've told him. We've said that, you know, your father, your grandfather and all them, they were all circumcised. He understood what he was getting himself into. It was Did you make have him to better. coax him into it? Absolutely not. Look, the thing with, um, with, this, with us is after the circumcision, we have this great big party. We dress him <laughs> like a sultan or the prince and we call a lot of our friends around. It's pretty much, I think there's a photo up there already. <laughs> Um, yes, there is. Now, which one is, is the Billy? The one on the right. The one on the right. And so we actually got our nephew done at the same time as well. So they were sort of a walking buddies. So they were sporting each other. And, <laughs> and what did he think about it yeah, when look, it happened? I, he, we, we got it done in the hospital. And the nurses, the doctors, they were absolutely fantastic. They knocked him out. They, and before the theatre, my <laughs> wife actually went in with him, made sure that he was okay. Did you, uh, if he hadn't had those infections, you, you think you still would have done absolutely. it anyway? Absolutely. Yeah. If your kid's not circumcised within the Turkish community, and I can only speak for the Turkish community, there may be outcasting of it as well. Um, and how big was the party that you had? The party, um, <laughs> look, um, we, had, uh, we had about sev 70 people. We had about 70 people. And so it's a big community. We had the event. big jumping castles, the kebabs, and everything. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, it, it's a sort of more of an ethnical thing that we, he made felt he felt comfortable. And a lot of the, I think most of the ethnic people know that we actually pin money on the person. I think we celebrate that he's actually gone to manhood. Did he complain about how much it hurt, or did he? I don't think he was aware of it. I think it was knocked out before he okay, happened. Okay, so he was but completely we did, we knocked did, out. We, we did, we did tell him that. Even before we came here, I asked him whether he would like it before or after. And he actually said it looked better now, and he felt quite better. How old is he now? He's six. He just had his sixth birthday about three days ago. Yeah. Kevin, you're from a remote community in the Northern Territory. Do all the boys in your community get circumcised? Yes, they do. They do. At what age? It's, it's at, at seven or eight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tradition that we've had all along through, throughout our history. We use a professional person who's good at do, doing like this, our Malaga here. How do they do it, Kevin? They what do it the same do? way like old fella, like what old fella said there. You know, pull that thing out and bang. Cut. Cut, bang. No and, do the, and do the boys get any, anything to stop the pain or do no, they No, they, they probably will give them a bit of, bit, bit of rake to chew on. Some cry, some, you know, weaklings, we call them weaklings. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. It's a tradition becoming a man. And you've got to, you gotta, you gotta, you know, stand the pain of becoming a, it's part of our culture that you become a man. And, and what would happen if you didn't get circumcised in, in your community? We don't have that. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It, so it's see, a long procedure leading up to it. It's, yes. You said about a month? Yes. Yeah. And then everybody participates. We, we send them out, get, get other people from other tribes coming in, and everybody getting together and performing our cultural sort of a happening. Then the parents have to cater for them. And our families have to look after the dancers and... Mm. Do all Aboriginal communities practice circumcision? Every tribal group have their own thing to, done. Everybody has their own song lines that they teach later that becomes part of the... part of through their manhood going up through ceremonies. And that enables them to understand and start showing respect. Okay, so 
Are there other reasons why people are getting young baby boys circumcised? For me, my son, Xavier, um, we made that decision uh, to circumcise him um, because we come from Botswana. Now, Botswana is a country like many other African countries that are ravaged by HIV and AIDS. Mm. And, um, and there is studies, uh, and yes, there are evidence that's out there that shows um, dramatic decrease in HIV infection for people who've been circumcised. To make that decision was very easy for us to do mm. because it will reduce um, the risk of infection. Uh, we are obviously going to be teaching him other methods, um, other strategies to prevent infection for HIV. Okay, I'm going to go to one of our international guests now. Um, Andrew Friedman in Los Angeles, welcome. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, you've looked at a lot of international research on male circumcision. Uh, I wonder what have you found is the main reason that people do it? Well, I think uh, what your audience has expressed is very much the, uh, the wide range of reasons that we see in our daily practice. Uh, for many patients, it's really a sense of a cultural connection either a religious connection or sort of a broader sense of the word culture. They feel that this has sort of been what their family always does or this is what is commonly done in their uh, nation of origin. There's certainly a large percentage of patients who feel that there is a health benefit. To be fair, my involvement was with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the task force that has developed the new guidelines. We're not partisans in this circumcision debate. We really feel our, we're sort of neutral evaluators of the medical literature to look specifically at medical risks and benefits without passing judgment on, uh, on other non-medical decision making that goes into the circumcision decision. Now your organization has just changed its view on circumcision. Why on male circumcision? Uh, this has been a steady process of revision since the 70s has been because of the new data related to HIV and protection from HIV acquisition in the specific setting of an HIV negative male engaging in high risk heterosexual behavior. That, that information was compelling enough to make us go back and look at the data and see what's been new since the last statement. Um, our change has really been very incremental. I think that people saw our previous stance as very neutral. People are seeing our stance as slightly positive. I think to be fair, what our stance boils down to is that there are some public health benefits from circumcision as a newborn, although they're very modest. There are some risks. Likewise, the risks are very modest. Overall, we feel that the risks, the benefits outweigh the risks, but not by enough that we are recommending circumcision for everyone. George Williams, you're a, a paediatrician and um, you also run an anti-circumcision website. What do you think about this decision in America and, uh, and what's been recommended and what's the situation here? I'm disappointed. Um, I thought that the American position and the Australian College is a fence-sitting position. The Dutch, Royal Dutch Medical Association say there is no medical indication for circumcision we should curtail the practice and stop circumcising children. Why is it that the European countries don't promote circumcision like the Americans and the Australians and the Canadians? But the couldn't right you ask the question? I mean, you could but ask that question But you are altering the body of another person. That person has a right to own but that the body. But the the risks, George. That's bullshit. No, no, that's no, not that's bullshit. bullshit. But, okay, but Andrew, can I get a response from you to that? Yeah. Yes, please. I think that, you know, one of the things that this discussion highlights is you know, it's, it's very easy to make your point depending on how you frame the, frame the data. There is a recognition that there's some benefit, but it's a very modest benefit in the United States. The CDC has estimated that the protective effect of circumcision in the U.S. based on its current modes of HIV acquisition would only be about 15% lifetime risk over a very small lifetime risk. And the same thing with the, with the penile cancer. We looked at this very, in very great detail in the technical report that accompanied the policy statement. And it's true, if you have a, a foreskin, you have a higher risk of, of penile cancer overall, but it's a very rare cancer. I think the thing is, you're never going to have a medical study that's going to be a knockout punch. You know, there's never going to be one study that's so great that's going to say everybody should have it or nobody should have it. 
So then it really comes down to how do you frame the ethical debate? And that's the discussion we should be having. And the paradigm that we adopted was that our overriding ethical concern is the best interest of the child. We recognize that circumcision crosses more paradigms than just medical paradigm. And so we feel that the person who's in the best position to decide what's in the best interest of their child over that child's lifetime is not me, is not the courts, it's the parent. Do you resent me taking away that human right to remove your foreskin? Why would I want somebody to go and cut something off me at this age? It would hurt <laughs> ten times more, like seriously. <laughs> but are you missing it? Do you want it back? <laughs> How can you miss something you don't remember? <laughs>Tonight we're talking about male circumcision. I want to talk about risks now, a little bit more, about the, uh, the risks of doing it and of not doing it. Uh, Amanda, you told your Jewish husband, Adrian, that you wouldn't marry him if he wanted to circumcise your future children. Why were you so passionately against it when it was a part of his culture? When I was in my late teens, I'd nannied for a short period of time and took care of a, a newborn baby that had been done. And uh, it was swollen and bruised and he screamed every time I touched his penis to change his nappy. And that stayed with me. And about a year or so after that, I joined a couple of human rights groups and started getting involved with female genital mutilation. And it started to click in my head, hang on, what's going on here? And I started to actually think that it was actually very similar. Um, and that it was uh, a, a body of a future man that uh, something was being taken away with him without his choice and um, that so you see it as a real human rights I, I, issue a fundamental human rights issue you I don't mean, think a parent has the right not to do when that? it comes to genital autonomy okay. I think every child has the right to have their body intact until they reach the age of 18 in whatever or whatever country they, they say they're of legal age to make that decision over their own body to share with whoever they fall in love with and what's their choices to and do And how did your husband feel about that clash between your ethical position on this and his cultural? He was shocked at first. His first instinct was to think that I thought something was wrong with him and he was a bit defensive. Because he's circumcised? Yes, yes. And but once he, once I, he, he, he obviously knew my interests before then. Um, and once I stayed, I stayed over the next few weeks to show him information. Um, there's, a, there's a high number of uh, Jewish communities in the US which are um, involved in anti-circumcision. Um, and I showed him some information that was coming out of there. And then he, he said that he would go along with it. OK, Tracy, I want to bring you in at this point because you uh, have your son Nathan here uh, who, who was circumcised. Now, what happened? Um, Nathan was five weeks when he was circumcised so um, I was a young single mother and was really struggling with the decision and the doctor that delivered Nathan offered to circumcise him in the hospital. Um, I knew I was having a boy and I went to great lengths to interview every man and some random strangers as to whether it was a good <laughs> idea to have my son circumcised. I looked at things like okay my grandfather my father my brother are all circumcised my boyfriend was circumcised most of the men I know are circumcised but the great trend at that time 20 years ago was to not circumcise boys it was a new thing you don't do it anymore and I felt like I should do it because everyone else before me had done it in the what end it happened? took me five weeks to decide to have him circumcised I was referred to someone who proceeded to um, botch the circumcision. So then we went into phase two of regret trauma. Um, Nathan actually ended up with stitches in his penis. The dressing that was supposed to stay on for a week fell off and the nappies, obviously, you know, it's not a hygienic situation under a nappy. So then we had an infection, antibiotics and some scarring for a short time. Nathan assures me everything's fine now. <laughs> um, Is everything okay now? Nathan? As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you feel hearing all this now, Nathan? I've got no problem. I don't remember the pain. I don't remember anything. Mm. I don't know any different. Do you What's... resent me taking away that human right to remove your foreskin? Why would I want somebody to go and cut something off me at this age? It would hurt <laughs> ten times more, like seriously. <laughs> but are you missing it? Do you want it back? <laughs> how can you miss something you don't remember? Okay. You, it's... Terry, how often do complications happen with circumcisions? Very, very rarely. The, um, Have you ever had problems with any not, of the... Not a proper botch job, no, never, Jenny. I've never had a transfusion, never had a systemic infection, 
never lost a penis. Now, it's good that you've never lost a penis. It is. <laughs> People will be very reassured to hear if, that. If you listen to the anti-circumcision mi um, minority groups, you'd think that it, it would happen all the time, but it's mm. extremely rare. Stan, you've performed circumcisions. Um, how commonly do these sorts of things well, happen? Well, <clears throat> I'm an adult urologist, so I see the tail end of young boys coming into puberty who are now faced with problems. We have a boy in Western Australia who has lost the gland's penis, the tip of his penis. And at the age of 24, he's trying to establish an identity. And it's just a critical thing for him, an unnecessary operation that went bad. The Do you dispute that there can be any benefit? I mean, in terms of hygiene or in terms of, of some of the things that we've heard talked about tonight? Jenny, the reality is it is education before removal. There are so many things that years ago, the first circumcisions done at early this 19th century were to stop boys masturbating and all the doctors got on board and then it was going to cure club foot, insan insanity, epilepsy. There is a vogue and we're going through a similar vogue now and the circumcision industry is looking for parameters to give it again a profile. Okay, Brian Morris in Melbourne, you're a passionate advocate for circumcision. Are you part of this vogue, this, um, this desire to, to, to make it something that everybody does now? I'm a medical scientist. You're a um, molecular biologist, is that right? I am, and I got into this area because I invented a, a new test for HPV, for screening women for cervical cancer, because... Uh, uncircumcised men increase the risk of cervical cancer in their female partners. But from that early beginning in the 1980s, I was drawn into this field and I can tell you that um, the benefits of circumcision start in infancy by protecting against urinary tract infections which are ten times higher in uncircumcised boys. For that reason alone, uh, circumcision is like a surgical vaccine. As they get older, they pro they're protected against inflammatory conditions uh, that affect 10% against phimosis, which causes painful and difficult erections as they get older and past puberty. But Brian, uh, but Brian we've already heard Andrew saying that, you know, the studies can be used this way and that way. I mean, you're being very absolute here. And a lot of people listening at okay. home are going, to think, Let, are going yeah. to think, well, what evidence do you have that is absolutely ironclad that suggests that these things are true? The American Academy of Pediatrics statement considered evidence up until April 2010. Um, they called for a risk-benefit analysis. In fact, the Circumcision Foundation of Australia consisting of prominent members of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, uh, wrote its own policy statement and published it earlier this year, in that there is a risk-benefit analysis where we listed all of the conditions uh, that circumcision protects against. And when we tallied them up, we showed that in fact, over the lifetime, a one in two males will suffer an adverse condition. And of course, many of them will die from some of those, such as HIV, penile cancer, and possibly prostate cancer as well. All right, George, you're shaking your head listening to this. Why? This is scaremongering. If circumcision is that beneficial, the whole of China, the whole of India should be circumcised. These are large populations. They don't practice circumcision. We don't see these diseases that Professor Morris talks about. They don't report these diseases. Yep. Do you understand? George. China if is I rife can, with it. If I, mm. yes, rife, rife this is with, absolute bunk. Rife with what? <laughs> HIV. Oh, HIV, but, but he's saying penile cancer. Yeah, but <clears> presumably <throat> not all the HIV in China can be attributed to uncircumcised penises. All the penises. Okay, yeah. oh, can the I ask Andrew this? Because Andrew has looked at the research yes. as part of his, his exercise. Andrew, do you agree with what Brian's saying? Yeah. Again, you know, one of the problems is, you know, everything he said, you could find a paper or a scientific study that supports what he says. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what you'll find is oftentimes you'll find conflicting reports. And what we find is that people who are very strong proponents will pull the papers that support them, and people who are very strong op op opponents will port find the papers that support them. We try to give a more balanced view. Andrew, what about the argument you, you mentioned before about ethics? You know, what about the argument of, of why would you interfere with a healthy male body when you don't need to at birth? Why do this procedure at all? 
this is actually the discussion I think that's going to be most beneficial for our society, is that parents make decisions that greatly affect their child in many ways for, throughout their lifetime. The question is, why does there have to be a single answer? I want to talk a little bit more about the risks of not being circumcised. Um, and Alison, you've wanted your son Ethan uh, circumcised now since he was born, really, six years ago. Why? We, we can't. We were told at the time that we, well, we were told we were bad parents for wanting to. Um, Where was this? In, in Tasmania. Devonport in Tasmania, yes. I made a submission because they're claiming that Tasmanian parents are choosing not to circumcise and we pretty much, we can't get a doctor in Tasmania to circumcise. I have about okay, so you can't get anyone in Tasmania to circumcise your son? No. Um, I have two sons, one that's six and a four-year-old. The four-year-old is fine. His foreskin retracts, we can clean. Ethan's foreskin doesn't retract at yeah. all and he gets constant infections. He's got an infection at the moment. Um, at first, we'd just take him to the hospital every time he had an infection because we thought that way they'd see he had problems and would do a medical circumcision if we pushed it enough. And they just say that I have to wait till he's eight and possibly then take him through to Melbourne. How many infections has he okay. had? Okay, uh, about every five weeks. He's got one at the moment. He gets an infection <coughs> about every five weeks. He does. Okay, Stan, your reaction rocks. to that? I mean, well, to, to a situation where you can't get a child circumcised when you want medical to? medical indications should not be thwarted. If there is a need to improve the quality of that child, previous treatments have failed mm. and all other alternatives have been dealt with. Do you accept that there are situations where a I circumcision do. is the right thing to do? Of course I do. For medical reasons, and there are many, and I have done them myself. But I'm not removing normal skin in infants that don't give consent for the procedure. Let's get back to Alison's situation. I mean, Alison, your response well, to that? Uh, he, my, my son is worried that his doodle -doo is going to fall off. That's what he asked the doctor. He sure. walked in, whipped his stacks down and said, is my doodle going to fall off because it's always sore? And I have, I can't look, I have it. great sympathy. And if I'd <laughs> seen you and you had had all the other t therapies, why would I deny you that? You do not teach them to retract the penis to clean it. That is a leading cause of infection. Oh. It retracts <laughs> when it's old enough to do so. Uh, Interfering and had teaching your child to, to do that will cause an infection. Propaganda lady. Yeah, but with respect, Amanda, you don't know the circumstances of this. <laughs> Reaction, Brian, to, to listening to this? Uh -huh. I mean, <clears throat> really, really, the, the issue is... Uh, uh, much like vaccination. So you call this uh, a surgical vaccination, is that right? It, it is. It is. It it's, is it's absolutely The issues incorrect. are very similar. In fact, it's much it safer. It's totally much okay, safer. George, your it reaction to that? No. Um, vaccination, you take a foreign look, protein, yeah, you take a virus, you take I, a bacteria, I, I you give it in the mouth, you inject it you know, in the child, it's a and you cause an immune response. What, what That's I what vaccination is. Most of all... Okay, one at, one at a time. What I resent... No. One at a time. Let Brian, let Brian finish. And cutting off, let, letting off the child's foreskin. Okay, wait a minute, George, okay. wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Brian, you finish, okay. I'll let George go I'm, ahead. I'm an academic. I'm an academic. I'm an academic too. I'm a scientist. <laughs> I have 35 publications in scientific journals. You're not a doctor, you're not a paediatrician. Let him finish, And I have many chapters in... Uh, large books, and these are all about circumcision amongst my th over 300 publications. Okay, but can I've I still practicing... ask you, Brian, I just want to ask you why you use this term surgical vaccine? Why do you see it in that way? Because uh, infant circumcision provides protection from a wide range of adverse medical conditions, some of which are fatal, to the man and to their future sexual partners, such as cervical cancer, over the lifetime. From cradle to grave, it provides enormous protections. Uh, the benefits exceed the risks by over 100 to 1. George, your oh. response. That's a rubbish. A vaccine <laughs> responds in your body to exposure to an antigen, and every time you're exposed to that antigen, you get an increased resistance to it. A circumcision exposes you to an antigen or an infection, and you have no resistance to it. OK, well, let's done. take the vaccine away from it. He's making the point that he believes that it provides protection in the way that a vaccine does, but, but, and you but, dispute that. It is not right. It is not good science. It is leading people into doing procedures which are unnecessary, which have complications, side effects, 
injury to patients and to believe that you are somehow sanctimoniously protecting the world and you will die with what, not one foreskin intact in the universe is absolutely not the right way to practice medicine. Okay, Sapati, so uh, you're studying here yeah. uh, and you had your 11-year-old son circumcised in South Africa last year. Mm -hmm. uh, why was that? It was uh, for medical reasons because he was getting infection and, you know, the penis will be sticking to the, the, the foreskin will be sticking to the penis and it will be a bit bloody and, you know, even the discharge. So it was for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But uh, when he was born, I was undecided, together with the father, whether to take him uh, to circumcision or not. But um, actually, we, 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 we thought of waiting for him to make his own uh, decisions, so that for medical reasons. Did this talk about HIV come into your decision at all? Actually, there was a campaign to uh, encourage males to circumcise as a way of minimizing the infection of HIV. So coincidentally, uh, my son also went for circumcision and the friends went for circumcision, uh, getting inspired by my son, mm. yeah. And Sharon, you're from Botswana. Yes. Yes, and yeah. you said that, that the HIV situation in Botswana, which has what, the second highest rate in the world? It, it, is, it is quite a, a, a very, um, scary situation. What the government has done, and this is, came about a recommendation from the World Health Organization and UNAIDS, that uh, for countries that have low uh, male circumcision and high prevalence of HIV, to scale up the male circumcision. 13 countries in Africa have taken up that preventative strategy for HIV, um, and that's in addition to a whole other strategies that are already in place. Is um, it traditional practice in Botswana? Yes, it used to be. Um, there are certain tribes that still practice that. Nowadays, obviously, they have to go to the hospital or have to a medical doctor to be able to perform that practice. Um, and was HIV the only reason that you did it? I mean, if that hadn't been in the picture, would there, would there have been other reasons you would have done it? I mean, for me, it was the main reason for my husband and I to make that decision. My husband is circumcised as well, and women that I know prefer males that are circumcised. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yes, you see, 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 yeah, big <laughs> nod up here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there was overwhelming feedback from my female friends at the time. Some of them actually said that that, that would be their only preference and they would actually not date a man that was not circumcised. There was a study done in Sydney in the mid-90s where women were asked what they preferred and 94% of them said they would prefer a circumcised partner. I do disagree, yeah. I've got a 17-year-old son and there's no problem there whatsoever. It's cultural mm -hmm. conditioning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cultural I mean, conditioning, George. Mm -hmm. It's completely cultural because I like, grew up in New Zealand mm -hmm. and you know who was circumcised and who wasn't because they were sort of excluded. It was quite a friendly school, but they were definite, they were called Cirque if they had a <laughs> circumcision. <laughs> Tracy? topic of being the same as the peer group. One of my biggest concerns, as I said, was to do what the, my past family members had done or what the current generation was doing and would my son mm. be different to everybody else and maybe be uh, ostracised or picked on because of that. So Nathan actually went to an all-boys boarding school for his six years of high school and I did actually quiz him only in the last couple of years on did he feel different to everyone else? Was there an overwhelming majority one way or another? Is it something that boys cared about or talked about? And his response? It's just like, just a question. You circumcised? Yeah, you know, whatever. There's, mm. there's, there's nothing right? different about yeah. it. Yeah, like no one cares. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, and, not and the other question I wanted to ask the younger men in the audience is a lot of the fathers say, oh, I want to do it because they'll, you know, they'll be worried about not looking like me. I mean, my dad's circumcised, I'm not. No, no difference. No, yeah. no I difference. I don't look at my dad's penis and be like, oh, what the <laughs> heck? <laughs> You're going through this process of trying to restore your foreskin. I'm using the stretching method and just using a weight. You need to do it in a group, you shouldn't do it by yourself. With regards to that in book a group? Yes. <laughs> well, you all get together and do it. Of course. It's a whole other dimension I hadn't even considered. <laughs>
We're talking about male circumcision tonight. Um, Carl, you chose to be circumcised at 18. Why? Um, I had a tight frenulum from quite a young age and it wasn't something that was rectified when I was a child. So a tight foreskin? You well, mean? the frenulum is the connective tissue that joins the foreskin to the glands of the penis on the underside where that ridge is. And that was always a bit tight for me and it was something that I always wanted to get rectified because I wasn't able to, for some period, um, clean properly. It just wasn't that comfortable and I really wanted to do something about it. Okay, and what did you do to prepare for this beforehand? Um, okay, well I did an awful lot of research. For some period I got quite sucked into a lot of anti-circumcision websites with a lot of their emotive and um, manipulative kind of rhetoric that they like to push about circumcision. Um, but there came a point where I started really questioning it because I found that the emotive um, language and imagery and discussions that they were having were really just trying to mask the fact that they had no evidence to back up their claims. So once I kind of got over that, I decided to look really deep into it and, and look much broader. So were you doing it just for that physical reason or were there other reasons as well? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think it's better, it looks better aesthetically. And, um, and you mentioned what I, what I did to prepare. I, for a period, I wore my foreskin back, which some men can do, and I did it, and I did it, I think, for two years. And that was a part of um, me figuring out if I would lose sensitivity from it, which didn't happen. So then I decided when I was 18 to go ahead with it. And I'm very happy. That's a pretty extreme thing to do. What, you wore what it back the whole time? Yeah, for a good two years. And I'm really glad I did that because it really, it, for me, it, made, it helped me ensure that what I was doing was the right thing and that I wouldn't lose any sensitivity. And that was something which I was a bit nervous about. And Stan, I understand did, you did this operation, is mm, that right? Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah I did. How did you feel about doing that, given that you don't like circumcision no, by the I, side I, of the no, for, you... for medical reasons, I am a very strong proponent of treating the patient, listening to the problems, dealing with them, again, conservatively if possible, and using surgery as the last step. And I think we had a lot of discussions. We went away from each other. I sent him away. Please think about it. Come back if you're so dogmatic. And he then was given a full consent, knowing all the things that could possibly go wrong. You were very good about that, Stan. Yeah. I remember that. that was and and, and really, really, I'm good. very comfortable in that circumstance. How does a newborn baby give informed consent for a procedure? Um, As Sung, I, I wanted to ask you too, because you chose to be circumcised in your early 20s. As yes, well? that's right. Why? And it's just for hygienic reason. Yeah. Okay. And, and why did you decide at that age, though? Was it something that you'd thought about for a long time, or? It's not the tradition in my family or culture that uh, we were circumcised when we were baby. So as I grew up, I heard all good things about being circumcised. So I chose to do that, and. I'm happy with that. Do you wish it had been done as a baby? Like when you hear this argument about the ethics of whether the parents should make the decision or whether it should be left to the child to make it when they're older, what do you think yeah, about actually, that? Yeah, actually I wish it, uh, it was done when I was a baby so I don't have to go through the well, process. It's easier, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so you both wish you'd had it done that as a baby. Yeah. Way the perspective of a baby well, as far as no, Okay, but no, I'm doesn't. asking for That's, their point yeah, of view. I'm not asking for your point yeah. of view. I'm asking for their point of view because they've gone through it and I'm just interested in what they think. And that's a good point because we actually have an understanding of this procedure that a lot of other people here do not have. We know what it's like before and after. There are so many people who, who will swear black and blue that it reduces pleasure and it ruins your sex life and all kinds of things and it's an absolute <laughs> load of bollocks. Elwyn, I wanted to ask you uh, about your experience because you wish that you hadn't been circumcised as a baby. Why? Yeah. Um, I can relate to what Carl said. However, I had a choice made for me that there's not much I can do to undo. When I realised that I was circumcised and I saw an intact penis, then I was quite shocked. So when did it reach a point where you became really concerned about it? Oh, uh, probably in my teen years. Where okay, and was this because of any health problems? Or was no. it purely aesthetic? What, what, what was the main reason? No, was I just became sexually active or sexually interested and I was... I became incensed that there were parts of me, that were part of my sexual anatomy that I didn't have. And we've heard people tonight talk about the, the responsibility that parents have to make decisions on behalf of their children. They have to decide what school to send them to and 
what sort of values to instill. But there are all sorts of decisions that parents don't need to make. And this is a decision that parents can make, but there's no need for them to make it. I would very much like to have been able to reach maturity and decide what to do with my own sexual anatomy. See, I find this very interesting. Desley, you're the mum here in this story. How do you feel when you hear that? Well, I feel, sometimes I feel guilty. Um, we had Elwyn circumcised when he was two weeks of age and the doctor said that he had a tightening of the foreskin that was not, you know, that needed to be circumcised. Um, so, so you were given a medical reason to do it? Yeah, we were. But uh, it was part of a family tradition also that males were circumcised, so we didn't feel guilt then. Um, the thing that I, I think is that we're talking about a lot of medical issues and cultural issues, but education, I think, is the most important factor here. I had very little education. I, it wasn't something that was discussed all the time mm. back then. Um, I grew up in a family that, you know, you didn't talk about all that sort of thing openly, whereas with my boys, we've been much more open with our conversations. So, it's so Ellen, where are you up to with this thing. now? What, um, what are you doing? Well, I have looked at the option of restoring, and that's when I first considered that, I thought that was radical and ridiculous. And when I say restoring, I mean restoring the foreskin. Um, and I dismissed it. I returned a few years ago to examining that option because I did find myself very consumed with um, annoyance and dissatisfaction. Are you still considering trying well, to Well, I actually um, have started that process. And, and what does that involve? Oh, there, there are ways of doing it. There are surgical options um, and they aren't... They aren't great, in my view, and I've spoken to urologists about it and they agree. Uh, they, they use things like scrotum tissue and stuff to um, replace the foreskin, which isn't, mm. isn't um, the same. The same. Mm. No. Other options, you know how people put things in their ears and they stretch the ears like that? Mm -hmm. You can take any remaining like foreskin. These. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but they also have you know, discs and, or in some places they put things in their lips and their lips end up with discs in them like that. It's basically stretching the tissue to make more tissue. And so what you can do is take um, any remaining tissue and use some um, long-term gentle tension on that to create more. But that's an arduous process. So just to summarise where you're up to at the moment, you're going through this process of trying to restore your foreskin. I have started it. I'm not sure if I have the discipline to complete it. <laughs> I'm using the stretching method. So actually um, using some simple, clean materials to grasp what um, foreskin is left and just using a weight or um, an elastic strap tied to the leg or something just to apply. To stretch it. Yeah. And is it working? It is actually. How it long is... does it take, sorry? Oh, it takes three two or three years. years. If, you're, if you're disciplined. How long? Three, three to three five years. years. Okay, cool. Oh, three to five years, Carl? I mean, George? Yeah. yeah it's it takes a, a long written time. On the subject. You need to do it in a group. You shouldn't do it by yourself. I would you need to be motivated and supported. With regards to that in book In a group. That, mm. yeah. <laughs> well, you all get together and do it. Of course. It's a whole other dimension I had never considered. <laughs> <laughs> but you store your birthright. <laughs> what belongs to you is belongs. It shows you, Jenny, that okay. to get in a group means that there are many men. There are internet sites. There are also. Yeah. This isn't just one aspect. There are a lot of men. OK, Andrew, I noticed you shaking your head during <laughs> listening to some of this. I just wonder what you make of what you're hearing at the moment about the lengths that people will go to well, to try to do something about it. No, no, actually, no, I understand. We are very sensitive to people wanting, you know, at the end of the day, we want people to be happy. I think that one thing that would help put it in context, though, is so if children who are not circumcised, about 3% will go on to have a medical issue. And that's different than someone who, as an adult, can make their own decision for aesthetic reasons. Uh, so it, it's, it's important to keep those two groups separate. I have been very convinced that there are people who are very adamant about wanting to restore their foreskin. And uh, unfortunately, as the gentleman mentioned, there really are no good surgical options uh, you know, that are well accepted at this time. Hmm. Um, where are we left with all of this, Andrew? I mean, it, given where your organisation is at at the moment, if you look around the world and if you look at different cultures, we have very different attitudes to this. What is the future for circumcision in various parts of the world? I mean, in Europe, it's very out of favour. Um, there seems to be right. a bit of a move back towards it in America. Well, how do you think it's going to turn uh, out? It actually, um, 
you know, most of the world doesn't have the circumcision dilemma. Most of the world, you live in a society where everyone does it or no one does it. It's really just the United States, Canada, and uh, Australia where there's sort of this circumcision decision and this whole dilemma and debate. Most of the world's circumcisions are really a closely held religious, cultural, ethnic value. And so it's, re it, it, it's really not this sort of a discussion about the health risks of circumcision or the medical indications of circumcision. I guess really where I think the debate should be held is in the culture and describe, rather than it, it forcing people to all fit into one mold, have, a, have the debate in the culture and let people come to what's best for them and that with that education you'll see what happens over time. Um, ben and Pip, you've listened to all of this. Uh, what do you think? Look, I'm, I'm personally still undecided. I think we've got to go home and we're going to have a pretty robust conversation about this. Um, I've heard both pros and cons here tonight and um, I, think, I think Andrew's points really resonated strongly. We, we have to go home and make a choice because um, that's what we do every day with Oscar. So. Mm -hmm. Will you let us know what you choose? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write in. Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it on the website. OK, so. thanks very much for joining us. And look, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, it's been really interesting and, and very good of you to share your experiences with us. I do appreciate it. Yes. Thank you to all our experts. And thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much, Brian, thank as you. well, for joining us uh, for this discussion tonight. And we do have to wrap it up now. But uh, you can, of course, keep talking about this online. Go to Insight's Facebook page, Twitter or our website. While you're there, you can find out more information about the new policy that our guest Andrew Friedman worked on and uh, also more information about circumcision in Australia and around the world.